Thank you very much, Julian. I have had the pleasure and the privilege of speaking at and attending many conferences, scientific and otherwise. And when we get to the end of the conference, uh, what tends to happen oftentimes is this, we have a speaker that's very typical of the other speakers. People are ready to go. They want to catch a plane. Q&A, if it exists, people are going out the door. So I said, all right, well, we need to set up a final speaker for which we're just going to end with that talk, forget the Q&A, let's send them out on a high note. And somebody recommended Lord Christopher Moncton. And I said, boy, I just don't know if he fits the bill. <laughs> and for anybody that has yet to see Lord Moncton speak, I'm sure you figured out I'm being quite facetious. You are in for quite a treat. Lord Christopher Moncton was special advisor to British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. Let's stop right there. That deserves applause. Lord Moncton's two articles in the Sunday Telegraph in 2006 constituted perhaps the most important turning point in the tide of public opinion against that quite noteworthy work of fiction, Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth. <laughs> Lord Moncton is a tireless warrior for the truth, traveling all over the world, often with and made possible by Bob Ferguson's Science and Public Policy Institute, meeting with global leaders, concerned citizens, and everyone in between, all in the dissemination of truth and sound science. Indeed, as you all witnessed this morning, after merely 10 minutes of breakfast conversation with Jay Lair, Lord Moncton dominated Dr. Lair's keynote presentation. <laughs> I suspect you're going to come away from Lord Moncton's talk just as impressed as I am every time I hear him speak. I'm very pleased to introduce to you Lord Christopher Moncton. My lords, that's me, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, after that truly magnificent introduction, I just can't wait to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> Joe Bast, in a forage cap, looks disturbingly like Fidel Castro. <laughs> Evviva la revolución! <laughs> what a year it has been. We are the consensus now. In the end, the truth is the center of every lasting consensus. And the truth is what is quietly pursued, often against overwhelming odds and fearsome hostility in academia, in politics and in the media by those of you in this room who have kept academic respectability and scientific integrity alive and I thank you. But should we be triumphalist? Should we crow? Should we rejoice? Hell yes! <laughs> of course we should. Because we, in this room, are among a very small, very brave band who have stood out against the forces of darkness and have sent them snivelling back to their noisome lairs. <laughs> and of course there are many good reasons why it was necessary that we should do what we have done. Because if you waste time, money and effort on a non-problem, then real environmental problems such as deforestation will not get attended to. And I'm going to show you now just how serious a problem deforestation can be. <laughs> uh, 
And if I may, I should like to pick out a few names from among those who are here today who deserve particular thanks for their contributions. And I'm going to begin with Fidel Castro and his team, because without them, the cross-fertilization of ideas which has been achieved in these four great international conferences simply could not have happened. So to the Heartland Institute and all their team, God bless them. I also want to pay particular tribute to the two gallant scientists, alarmist scientists, we won't call them, who kindly agreed to enter the lion's den and be part of this conference with us and have a debate. Can we have a round of applause for both of them? Because what has been lacking in this debate is debate. <laughs> Albert Arnold Gore, I delivered to your electricity guzzling mansion in Tennessee three years ago by hand, inscribed on parchment, <laughs> an invitation to a public debate on your mawkish sci-fi comedy horror movie. And, unaccountably, I am still waiting for a reply. Al, baby, you can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> Here he is. This is the publicity poster for that movie. Can anyone point out what is rather obviously wrong with the graph of temperature against time there? Anyone see it? Yes, there is a rather interesting re-entrant there. The graph just below the word all there points backwards. Yep. I just done made it all up. And here is another interesting example of propaganda. This was produced by, I kid you not, the Professor of Climate Change Impacts. That's rather like having a Professor of Train Wrecks. Anyway, <laughs> Professor of Climate... There is now such a, a character as the Professor of Climate Change Impacts at Imperial College London. And what he was illustrating here is what would happen to the Houses of Parliament if Al Gore were right and global sea level were to rise by 20 feet. To which my reply is, and your problem is? <laughs> As a member of the upper house of that legislature, albeit without the right to sit or vote, I know perfectly well that if there were a choice between one house or another, we should of course abolish the House of Commons and restore government once again into the hands of the hereditary peerage. <laughs> However, unfortunately, this does not seem to accord with the mood of the times. <laughs> Never mind, we've changed much else in this room. Maybe we can change that too. <laughs> now, this is uh, a card, the Nine of Diamonds being the curse of Scotland where I live, which was produced by George Monbiot, and the words, that charlatan, are my qualification for speaking to you today, for I am not a scientist, and if you listen to Representative Jay Inslee, who is some kind of Mickey Mouse congressman uh, <laughs> in what was once your great and respected Congress, uh, I'm not a real lord either. But if you read your ClimateGate emails with due attention, you will find that Michael Mann of Penn State University, in an email to somebody who had written to me about a scientific question and I'd written back, and the guy had written to me saying, yes, I think this is a very good answer, and he'd copied it to Michael Mann. Michael Mann said, how dare you write to that charlatan? 
So I'm sure that somebody who is regarded by Michael Mann as a, as a charlatan is a suitable person to address you here today. <laughs> Now, I have been unaccountably criticised for sometimes doing nothing but tell jokes and have political fun at the expense of liberals, progressives, radicals, socialists and Marxists, or as we call them, the Obama administration. <laughs> and of course I... I must take these criticisms seriously, and so what I'm going to do is to run through the testimony which I gave before Congress last week, before the Global Warming Committee of the House, at the kind invitation of Representative Jim Sensenbrenner of Wisconsin, who is arguably... Yes, let's hear it for, for Jim Sensenbrenner. He is... He is arguably the best informed member of either House of... Uh, the Congress, and in particular, he has got the point that the one thing we don't want is a cow fart tax. <laughs> now, what I did uh, when he kindly invited me to give evidence was to put in front of Congress what I call the policymaker's dilemma. I'm not a scientist, I'm a policymaker. And that means that when I was working for Margaret Thatcher, and when I'm advising governments and corporations, as I do from time to time today, those with whom I am dealing will be experts in their subject, and I, as a policymaker, and therefore inevitably to a large extent a generalist, will not. So they have the advantage of the policymaker. And the scientific community has, if you'll forgive me, taken ruthless advantage of that advantage and has misled the political community. And so what I did was I just took one item from the IPCC's documents and I examined that one item and tried to work out what was being hidden and to work out why they were trying to hide it. But while I'm on the subject of the IPCC, my policy for the future of that body is that it should be abolished. <laughs> if only because of the appalling prose style. <laughs> a marriage of a constipated bureaucrat and the gas board. <laughs> and I have been asked by several of you to repeat the IPCC's definition of a spade. Of course, they do not call it a spade. That would be too simple. They call it a one-person-operated, manually-controlled, foot-powered implement of simple and robust, yet adequately efficacious lignometallic composition, designated primarily, though by no means exclusively, for utilisation on the part of highly paid operatives deployed in the agricultural, horticultural, or constructional trades or industries, as the case may be, for purposes of carrying out such excavational tasks or duties as may from time to time be designated by supervisory grades as being necessary, expedient, desirable, apposite, or germane, with regard to the ongoing furtherance of the task, or objective in hand, or on the other hand, underfoot, Secretary-General. <laughs> So now let's have some fun with just one graph from the IPCC's document. This is the science bit of the presentation. And so, Myron, if you're watching, I hope this pleases you. For the rest, normal political fun will be resumed as soon as possible. <laughs> Here, then, is the hockey stick graph that appears in the 2007 IPCC report. Uh, thanks to Steve McIntyre and Ross McKittrick, both of whom graced us with superb presentations here uh, this week, the hockey stick of the 2001 report has been utterly and thoroughly discredited. <laughs> and I think we need to be particularly grateful both to Steve for doing the initial res research and also to Ross for joining in the fun and getting those distinguished papers into the literature in the teeth of fierce opposition 
from the so-called peer review process, which is now a way of filtering out anything that disagrees with the socialist orthodoxy that is science today. So can we give them a really thunderous round of applause? Now, this particular hockey stick graph uh, shows underneath it that sort of grey area, appropriately foggy looking. That is the Hadley Centre's temperature record, global mean surface temperature, for the past 150 years. And you will see that they have imposed upon that stochastic record four arbitrarily chosen trend lines starting at places that suited them. The plain intention of this graph which is explicitly stated in the three places in the document where it is used large and in full colour, is to try to show that the rate of global warming is itself accelerating with the stated implication that we are to blame. Now, when I saw this graph, I realised at once that it was bogus. Anyone who has taken Statistics 101 knows that you may not put multiple trend lines on the same stochastic data set with arbitrarily chosen start points and then draw any conclusions whatsoever as to the trend or acceleration or deceleration in trend of the data by reference to the relationships between the slopes of the different trend lines. That is an old and entirely impermissible statistical fraud. So when I saw it, I thought we should confront Ipecac with it. <laughs> so I went to Copenhagen and was appalled to find the whole place covered in green socialist banners everywhere, which rather implausibly said, Brad Pitt saves the planet. <laughs> and there I found... Dr. Rajendra Pachori, who is the chairman of the IPCC. Did I hear somebody hissing there? Yes, I think I did. Can't you hiss louder than that? Now, of course, we mustn't be unfair to dear Dr. Pachori because he's not a climate scientist. He's a railroad engineer. He's the Casey Jones of the IPCC. And, of course... He was giving, in his lecture at the University of Copenhagen, among other things, this graph. And he was saying, this is illustrating that the problem is getting worse. <laughs> so I knew he would use this graph. So I took him a 10-page letter explaining, uh, in words of one syllable, why this graph is wrong. Uh, it's very difficult when you're explaining climatology to a railroad engineer. But anyway, I did my best. And he, uh, and he said, well, he said, um, that is a very deep point that you are making. I said, no, it's a very elementary point that I'm making. The graph is bogus, it is fraudulent, and I'm going to give you two days to withdraw that graph and make sure that a correction is published on the IPCC's website, or I'm going to report you for criminal fraud to the public authorities. And he said, fraud is a very strong word. And I said... Dr. Pachori, fraud is a very serious crime, and I am going to report you for it unless I see some evidence of good faith from you in getting this graph corrected. And he was hustled out of the room, and the meeting was brought rather hastily to an end to the cheers of the audience, many of whom were friends of mine who had happened to come along for the event. <laughs> and... So a week later, I always give them longer than I say I will, because you've got to be kind. A week later, I wrote to the Charity Commission in the United Kingdom because Rajendra Pachori is the, at the moment, the sole trustee of a charity called TERI Europe, the Tatar uh, Industries Research Institute. And... That charity has filed accounts for the last four years, you can see them ringed, with a very low income, indeed below £10,000 in each of the years, £26,000 in total. 
And I happened to be trawling in a nerdish sort of way through the government's websites in the UK. And here is the Department of Food and Rural Affairs and Silly Walks. And what it shows is a grant of more than £30,000 in just one of the four years concerned to TERI Europe. So I pointed out to the Charity Commission that these are the figures that appeared on its own website and that this is what appeared on the government's website. And I said, should I be reporting this to the police as criminal false accounting? Within two days, the Charity Commission had got in touch. They said, we have checked with the charity. It has accepted that it filed false accounts. It will be providing true accounts and we will then be deciding whether or not and whom we will prosecute for the false accounting that has plainly arisen. So when Steve McIntyre says we shouldn't use words like fraud, yes, we should when fraud is plain and evident, and I don't think that anyone should be immune from prosecution from, for fraud just because they have diplomatic immunity, because they are, as a railroad engineer, the head of the UN's climate panel. <laughs> so back to this bogus graph. What I decided to do was to find out what it was they were trying to hide. So I removed uh, railroad engineers, Pachori's railroad lines from the graph, cleared them all away, and here is the graph again. And this time I have added two lines of my own. These are trend lines which I have arbitrarily chosen. And as you will see, the trend line from 1905 to 2005 is rising at only half the rate of the trend line from 1905 to 1945. Thank goodness, global warming is slowing down. <laughs> now, we're going to do science like the IPCC does science. We're going to take a vote. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to say, how many of you say that this graph is correct? Not even one. No, nope, very good. Uh, and how many of you say that this graph is correct? <laughs> come on, come on, let's see. Well, I usually begin my talks by saying that you should never believe a word I say, because, of course, <laughs> this graph is just as bogus as the other graph. I have used the same bogus statistical technique on the same data with different starting points and have come to a precisely opposite result from which it logically follows that the technique itself is bogus, QED. <laughs> so, what then is the truth? We now know what isn't the truth. What is the truth? Well, here it is. There were three periods of rapid warming over the last 160 years. 1860 to, uh, 1860 to 1880, 1910 to 1940, and 1975 to 2001. And as you can see, they are strictly parallel rates of warming. And even if you don't do it by the eyeball method, and you do the least squares linear regression trend on the data over those periods, they are indeed strictly parallel. And to check that, I got Roger Harabit of the BBC, who has been at this conference, to ask Dr. Jones of the uh, Hadley Centre of the CIU to confirm that these three rates of warming are strictly parallel, and in particular that the third and most recent rate of warming is no higher than the other two. And Phil Jones, for at heart he is an honest soul, said, yes, it is true, there has been no acceleration in the warming rate, they are three strictly parallel rates of warming. And that made a news story, believe it or not, because somehow none of them had managed to say that before. To make assurance doubly sure, I had a question put down in the House of Lords. I don't have a seat and I don't have a vote, but I do have a voice. So I put the question down. And the answer came back from the government through gritted teeth that indeed the three rates of warming were indeed parallel, but that nevertheless the government's policy was that we were going to bankrupt the British and uh, European economies by pursuing uh, the same old policies, regardless of any mere data that got in the way. 
or words to that effect. <laughs> and so what I thought was, let's check once more. I, I, you have to check everything so many times in science. So I got in touch with Senator Vitter's office. And I said, would you mind writing to Dr. Holdren and asking him? And Dr. Holdren wrote, wrote back saying, yes, the first two are parallel at 0.16 Kelvin per decade, but the third one is 0.23 Kelvin per decade, a 50% increase in the warming rate. Now, he must have known that if he was using the same data as the IPCC, which is the Hadley data, that simply was not true. Now, I regard it as a very serious matter that a paid public official of your administration should write what appears to me to be a deliberate and conscious falsehood to a senator making a straightforward scientific inquiry. And I hope that this failure to get the facts right on the part of the administration will in future cease <coughs> Because from now on, a lot more scientific questions are going to be directed by both houses of Congress to this administration's scientific team. And they will expect that those questions will in future be fully and honestly and accurately answered. <laughs> now, we cannot explain what caused the first two of these three periods of warming because we didn't have enough ways of measuring at the time. We know that the warming happened. You can see it is a 60-year periodicity or quasi-periodicity, almost certainly related in some way to the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which shows a similar periodicity. But we can try to work out what it was that caused the third and most recent period of warming. And as you will see, that third and most recent period of warming accounts for very nearly all of the warming that has occurred since 1950. The warming which we are told by Ipecac was chiefly caused by us. However, in this period, which is the satellite era, and you can see I've marked it there with a green line representing 1983, where we first had satellites measuring not only temperature but also radiation and clouds. So I then looked around the literature to try and find out whether there was anything that explained why we got a sudden increase in warming, just as we appear to have done twice before. And I came across this paper by Dr. Pinker and her colleagues, which shows that there was a general global brightening from 1983, when the satellites first went up there, until 2001, and that that global brightening was the equivalent of 2.9 watts per square meter of extra sunlight reaching the Earth because there were fewer clouds in the way during that period. You do not gasp with astonishment, but you should, because according to Ipecac, the entire anthropogenic if influence, admittedly at the top of the atmosphere rather than at the surface, in watts per square meter, for the whole of the 256 years from 1750 until 2005 was just 1.6 watts per square meter. So here we have an enormous influence naturally occurring. We can tell it's natural because it doesn't track with the monotonic increases in CO2. The temperature record is clearly stochastic and these sudden surges in temperature are not caused by CO2. They are clearly natural. And this natural warming, I wondered how much warming would 2.9 watts per square meter cause. So I did some sums and found that 2.9 watts per square meter would cause so much warming that it would have caused more than all the warming since 1950. And that suggested that it may be that although Dr. Pinker very carefully looked at four separate records, two satellite and two terrestrial, she may have over-egged the pudding. Nevertheless, I did the sums. First of all, I wanted to know what was our contribution to uh, warming over that period in theory. And so I looked up the formulae for calculating the watts per square meter of extra radiant energy at the top of the atmosphere this time that were contributed by various prominent greenhouse gases. And that came to the total you see at the bottom there. Then I did the following analysis. 
we took the change in surface temperature uh, as being the change in surface temperature caused by the extracellular radiation reaching the surface plus the change in surface temperature caused uh, by the forcings at the top of the atmosphere from the various greenhouse gases that we had added. And so then what I did was to check the feedbacks to find out which forcings and which feedbacks would apply in a case where there had been, as there plainly has, some global brightening over those years. And I found that we have to exclude, of course, the uh, negative forcing from the particulate aerosols, which the UN uses as a fudge factor to allow it to overstate climate sensitivity, because plainly the global brightening measured by Dr. P Pinker already included all effects from that particular source. We also have to exclude the cloud feedback because that will have been part of the uh, global brightening that she measured. That then gives us a feedback value of 1.75, roughly, lower than the 2.81 which the UN would otherwise have used. So then we uh, produce the result. And the result is this. If Dr. Pinker's, um, if we take just 30% of Dr. Pinker's forcing, the radiation coming down to the Earth, then the UN would appear to have overestimated climate sensitivity almost fivefold. And if you go anything above 35% of Dr. Pinker's quite carefully measured value, there is no room for any of the greenhouse gases to have had any influence whatsoever. And that, I suggest, is what they were trying to hide by putting all those railroad lines on the graph. And you might want to know what has happened since the end of the UN's graph in 2001. Well, here it is. For the last nine full years, there has been a very slight, not statistically significant, decline in global mean surface temperature. And there you see the actual data, which is a combination of the uh, RSS and UAH records, just the same as, as Roy Spencer had this morning. The difference is that this graph goes down and his goes up, and I'll explain why. Because his graph was confined to land data, where because of the urban heat island effect and other influences, there has been a slight rise in temperature over the period, and this is global, including the oceans, where there has been a slight decline. So what we're looking at here is a pattern of warming and cooling and warming, which appears to have been very strongly dominated by a naturally occurring global brightening, a withdrawal of the clouds for a time, which allowed more sunlight to reach the Earth. And from that, we can calculate in various ways that climate sensitivity is very low. And how do we check it? Well, here is a graph from Dr. Willis Sue. And I would like to talk a bit about Willis Sue. This is a very diligent expert on solar influences, particularly on the Arctic climate. He clings on by his fingernails at the Harvard-Smithsonian Institute for Astrophysics because the usual suspects have been trying to lever him out of there for years, pushing him into smaller and smaller offices, into outbuildings, into cupboards just about. And they've also now uh, thrown a, uh, a Freedom of Information Act request at him uh, to turn over all his emails to them, and he writes several hundred a day, so goodness knows what they're going to do with those. But this is a good and diligent researcher who has become a great friend. He's my colleague in Bob Ferguson's Science and Public Policy Institute. Give him a round of applause. And what his graph here shows is that over Japan, where they have had pyranometers measuring the amount of sunlight, the number of hours of sunlight actually reaching the ground, and they've also measured temperature in the area of the South China Sea, the pyranometer record is in red of the sunlight reaching the ground, and the blue is the temperature, and there appears to be quite a good correlation between them. Now, one knows that in logic, correlation does not necessarily imply causation. One knows also that not elsewhere in the world do you find necessarily the same results. However, this is a very impressive result, and it does raise the possibility that what we should now do 
is mount both thermometers and pyranometers together at key positions all around the globe, on the oceans if possible, as well as on the land, to try to verify the extent to which these global brightenings and dimmings, and gl global brightenings perhaps that may have occurred over secular as well as decadal timescales, are having a very major influence, as they appear to be, on what we think, or had been told to think, was anthropogenic global warming. Here's another way of checking it. Consider the curly mallee tree. How many of you have seen one? I didn't think many of you would, because they only grow in one place. They're a hypax phenomenon. They only grow in Australia. They grow at Broken Hill and again in the northern Flinders Ranges, where this photograph was taken. Now, I had the privilege of visiting Australia for a month earlier this year, at a time when Kevin Rudd was making up his minds about whether or not he should have um, a cap-and-trade scheme. And I'm glad to say they took an opinion poll before I went and an opinion poll when I left a month later, and public opinion had moved 10 percentage points towards scepticism in that time. <laughs> now, the main reason why this result was achieved was Ian Plymer, who kindly came with me around most of the tour, uh, as did Bob Carter for part of the tour, and kindly introduced me and gave a kind of scientific validity to my ramblings on the subject of the climate. And Ian also took me to see this particular region of Australia because curly mallee trees only grow on dolomitic rock. And here you'll see at Stubbs Waterhole, there's a thin grey line, which you can just see. That is tillite. It's uh, the remains of a glacial moraine. And right next door to it is the yellowish dolomitic rock. And what this means is that this particular part of Australia, which was at the equator 750 million years ago, when the dolomitic rocks were deposited, had 300,000 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, and glaciers a mile high at sea level and at the equator. Now, if the UN's climate panel were right about the warming effect of CO2, those glaciers simply could not have existed. So I found that very impressive testimony, and I want to hear a very good round of applause for our two gallant geologists, Ian Plymer and Bob Carter. And here's another way of checking, done by one of the most distinguished physicists that we have in this game, Professor David Douglas of Rochester University up in New York State. Now, this record here, we're going to applaud him in a moment, but let's applaud him now anyway. This record is the Argo bathythermograph record, 3,300 automated buoys reporting by satellite what the temperature and salinity of the oceans are on a daily basis. And they show a decline in ocean temperatures over the last six or seven years. So David Douglas and his distinguished colleague, Professor Robert Knox, decided they would analyze data such as this going back 50 years to try to work out whether contrary to what NOAA has been saying, there has been any uh, net accumulation of heat in the oceans at all, because it is agreed among all sides that if we are causing the warming, then 80 or 90 percent of it should end up in the oceans. And their paper, which of course has not been reported in the mainstream literature, but is in the peer-reviewed literature, establishes that indeed for 50 years there has been no net accumulation of heat in the oceans. And that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> and then uh, this was a, a graph shown by Professor McKittrick yesterday, also discussed by Professor Singer. Now, Professor Singer, it's nice to have a rocket scientist on our team. And this is a guy who could have retired long ago from the fray, but at a very great age, he is the grandfather of us all, persists in standing up and fighting gallantly all over the world for the truth. God bless you, Fred Singer.
Fred was among the earliest to notice, as again were professors Douglas and Knox from Rochester, that there is a rather intriguing discrepancy between what these wretched Xbox 360s and Playstations, <laughs> driven by Ipecac's zitty teenagers, purport to show and what goes on in the real world. And here is a paper, and you're going to really hiss at this one, by Ben Santa, good, from 2003, because it had been realised that if you add CO2 to the atmosphere, it doesn't cause much warming at the surface because its absorption bands are overlain by those of water vapour. You can only really get some warming further up. And the IPCC's 2001 report showed a similar uh, picture to the one labelled man-made greenhouse forcing there, but it didn't show this great hot spot. It showed something more like a poached egg with a very pale warming around the edge and a slightly more intense one in the middle. And that clearly wasn't going to uh, allow anyone to say that the radiative forcing from CO2 is anything like as strong as the Ipecac is trying to claim. So Santa produced this paper, which was seized upon with predictable alacrity by the IPCC, and trying to show that if and only if man-made man greenhouse uh, forcing is the cause of the warming, then you will get a tripling of the surface warming rate in the tropics high up in the tropics, and you'll find that all the models show this. Here are four runs of different models from Lee et al. 2007, and I'm very grateful to Professor Richard Lindzen for letting me have that paper. And as uh, Fred and others have shown, the predicted hotspot is not there in measured reality, except in the virtual reality in which Ben Santa lives. It isn't there. And that, once again, means you have to divide by perhaps as much as three the warming effect of CO2 and of all other greenhouse gases. Another confirmation that climate sensitivity, as it is called, is likely to be low. And here is another one. And this is from the great man himself. And I want to talk about the great man himself, <laughs> Professor Richard Linson. This is a man who has withstood for 35 years, the isolation and vilification of too many of his colleagues simply because he wished to follow the evidence wherever it led. And for 20 of those years, he has been patiently accumulating measurements from the Earth Radiation Budget Experiment Satellite of how much radiation is actually escaping into space. All of the models show, as you can see here, that as you increase sea surface temperature from left to right on the x-axis, so you get what appears to be a decline, and in most of the models it is actually a decline, in the outgoing radiation uh, at the top of the atmosphere. That's what the models show. And all of those models are showing, whether or not they show an actual decline, they're certainly show, showing that there would be what's called positive feedback, amplification of any initial surface warming. But the measurements, and now watch the central panel, show that. And it's only when you see data like this that it becomes easy to appreciate just what a brilliant and dazzling result this is. Now, Dick, I know, would put all sorts of caveats on it because he's a very honest and honourable scientist. And he would say, well, we're not perhaps taking full account of longer-acting feedbacks. There are, of course, uncertainties in the measurements. There are uncertainties in the way the models are represented, etc., etc. But nevertheless, this is certainly an admirable methodology which, with improved technology, better satellites, and more methods of observation, will perhaps be the methodology that settles this question once and for all, even if it hasn't already been settled by the graph that you see in front of you. And I want to express my gratitude, and perhaps that of this conference, for the greatest climatologist of his age, for his courage, his friendship, and his learning. God bless you. Dick Linz.
Now, very briefly, all you need to know about the economics of global warming in one simple equation, the equation they've done their best to conceal from you. Here it is. And I have modestly called it Moncton's equation. Of course, it's not really mine, but I'm going to uh, misappropriate it. And this is, simply states that the change in surface temperature in response to a given change in the proportionate increase in CO2 is 8.5 plus or minus 1.8 Fahrenheit degrees times the logarithm of the proportionate increase. Now, you may say, what has that gobbledygook got to do with anything? The answer is this. It shows why cap and trade, and indeed any measure to try to forestall global warming by stopping emissions of carbon dioxide, is doomed to abject and appallingly costly failure. As you'll see from the graph there, the atmospheric CO2 concentration at the moment is around 388 parts per million. If we use the Moncton equation and add two parts per million to that, which would, is what we would emit in a year, it comes out to a dazzling 0.044 Fahrenheit. Why does that figure matter? Because that is the amount of global warming you would forestall in one year today if you closed down the entire global carbon economy. Not a car, not a plane, not a train, not an aircraft, nothing. No power stations, no electricity, no hotel here. There'd be no elevators, and who's going to walk up to the 35th floor? <laughs> The whole place shut down with all the disease and death and destruction that such a catastrophic policy would entail, and you would forestall 0.044 Fahrenheit of warming. Take the reciprocal of that as a rough and ready way of working out the minimum number of years it would take to forestall just one Fahrenheit degree of warming, and you're looking at very nearly a quarter of a century. And that is on the assumption that the UN's estimates of the climate sensitivity to CO2 are not the fourfold exaggeration that most of us at this conference think that it is. If the fourfold exaggeration is indeed an exaggeration, then to forestall one Fahrenheit degree of warming, you would have to close down the entire global economy for a hundred years. And that's all you need to know about the economics of global warming. It is. Even if there is a problem, which there isn't, it is orders of magnitude cheaper and more cost effective to adapt to it, as our adaptable species has done so often in the past, than to try to mitigate it. It's as simple as that. And this is what happens if you get careless about how much money you print. <laughs> this banknote would once have bought you a postage stamp. It won't even do that today. It won't even buy you a piece of paper the size of that banknote. And that's where we are headed if we cannot rein in the propensity of governments around the Western world who claim to be trying to save us from ourselves, though uncannily it's always at our expense, from wasting our money on this global warming chimera. At a time of grave economic hardship, from which we are largely immune, but the working people of America and the world are not, it is the height, not only of folly, but of cruelty, to spend any more money whatsoever on trying to mitigate global bloody warming. <laughs> and finally, the very heavy political cost of the prodigious diversion of effort, time, and your money and mine that ill-educated governments are making from reality the political cost of that. There are three separate actions which the administration in this country is taking or proposes to take to try to prevent global warming. 
They are all doomed to have absolutely no effect on the climate, but they're also doomed to be the most expensive measures your administration has ever taken in peace or war. The first of these is the Kerry-Lieberman bill. Now, all you need to know about that bill, and I hear some hissing, and that's very justifiable, is that it's, it's been very craftily crafted so as to tempt the executive boards of the major utilities and oil companies into going along with it and not opposing it. It allows them, indeed requires them, prodigiously to put up the prices of electricity and of gasoline at very rapid rates over the next 20 years, but does not require them to pay that money to the government. So there are going to be a dozen people in each of a dozen corporations, 150 people in all, who between them are going to share $250 billion in the next 20 years, taken per force from the pockets of the poor. That bill shall not pass. The second measure that they're planning on is EPA regulation. And I was fascinated and indeed encouraged when I heard Harrison Schmidt. Isn't it great that not only do we have a rocket scientist, but we have an astronaut among us. <laughs> Harrison Schmidt, a lover of his country and of its great constitution, a constitution which I hugely admire, who gave us a very careful analysis of why it is that the Constitution doesn't allow the EPA to make laws for the people of America. And indeed, he needn't have gone any further, in my view, than Article 1, Section 1 of the Constitution, which says, all legislative power herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives Period. There is no mention, no mention of the EPA. No mention of any of the so-called executives, so-called agencies of so-called government that now issue so-called laws and so-called regulations upon us with absolutely no constitutional power or justification whatsoever. And just at the moment when the auto industry is dragging itself up after the collapse of the financial system, along comes the EPA and shuts it all down again. How clever is that? <laughs> and then we have the third initiative that the Obama administration is taking, which is to try to push forward the treaty that failed at Copenhagen and will also fail at Cancun, because I shall be there to stop it. <laughs> Now, in October last year, Willie Soon, who reads everything, found a copy of this then very secret treaty and sent it straight to me. Had it not been for his diligence, the world would never have known what the draft treaty said, and we should not have been able to stop it. He deserves another round of applause. What the treaty said, and they are still handing out copies of it. I was in Bonn recently at a UN meeting and they were handing out copies of this treaty draft. They were going to set up a world government and the word government actually appears in the treaty draft. The government was be going to be ruled by not a policeman but the conference of the state's parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And it was going to have 300 interlocking new bureaucracies all of them paid for by us, all of them lording it over us, and it was going to have all power to regulate all formerly free markets. The free market was going to be abolished under this draft treaty. Furthermore, it was going to impose upon us, without representation, enormous taxation on a scale never before seen in the history of humankind. And these are the democratic provisions for 
the election of this world government. Yes, the words election, ballot, democracy, vote, do not occur even once in the 186 pages of this draft. And it was not until Willie soon got this treaty to me and I got it out there that anyone had even heard of it because negotiators for this country and for other countries in the Western world who had gone through this draft time and time again, not one of them had thought to tell the people that they were about to sign away the democracy of that this treaty even existed. You cannot trust the governing class here or worldwide. So what does this mean? It means that you cannot divorce the science and the economics from the politics. I wish we could. Science, in the end, is not susceptible of being politicised. Scientific truth is scientific truth, however many politicians wish it wasn't scientific truth. It doesn't matter how many of them vote to try and turn down the scientific truth. The scientific truth remains the truth. It doesn't matter how many of them tell lies. However many lies are told, the scientific truth remains the scientific truth. And though lies can do harm in many ways, they can do no harm to the truth itself. But what is behind this? What is behind this movement to shut down the economies of the West? It is not just communism ready vivus, communism restored, communism wanting to fight the Cold War battles again, but this time by getting us to shut down our own economies from within. It is a far nastier movement among all parts of the political class, with the honourable exception increasingly now of the Republican Party here in the United States, and of course of the Liberals in Australia. God bless them. <coughs> It is nothing less than an attempt by the world's rich and powerful to suppress the weak and powerless and to take away the one levelling constitutional practice which gave us, the little guys, the chance to face up to them, the big guys, and that is the ballot box. That is what is at threat here. That is what they are trying to take away. And I find it despicable that they are doing this at a time when your troops here in America and our troops in the United Kingdom are fighting shoulder to shoulder on freedom's far frontiers, fighting and too many of them hurting and dying. And I want to hear it for our troops. And if I may, I shall end by borrowing some words from your 16th president on the battlefield of Gettysburg. And he said this, that from these honoured dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God will have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not
Thus concludes the fourth International Conference on Climate Change. We hope to see you again next year. Uh, for any of the speakers, any of the scientists that uh, would like to stay around and uh, share information, converse with Lord Moncton, by all means, as long as uh, the room is available, please feel free to, uh, to hang out and have a good time. Thank you very much.